Uh, hello to all of those who uh, have decided to uh, tune into this webcast. Uh, good to have you. Uh, my guest this afternoon is Mohammed Sahimi, uh, professor at uh, University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and uh, an excellent commentator on Iranian affairs, uh, not only domestically, but <clears throat> in terms of international policy and also in terms of what's going on in the diaspora. Um, I, he, Mohammed came to my attention when he was writing uh, a series of absolutely superb pieces uh, uh, for Low Blog, um, which is a website I think now folded into responsible statecraft and, and yeah. good for Jim Loeb. Uh, welcome, Mohammed, and thank you very much for giving me the time. Thank you for having me uh, uh, in your program. And uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be speaking to you, Patrick. Terrific, thanks. Uh, uh, why don't we start with the obvious question, which is, I mean, there are many ways to uh, go at things this afternoon, but uh, the one that's right in front of us, I think, is the Ir Iran nuclear accord and the negotiations now going on in uh, in. Uh, between various hotel rooms in Vienna. Um, uh, I, I wonder uh, if you could um, talk to me about what your expectations have been since the Biden administration announced its intent to rejoin the accord. I, I must say, I, I've been a skeptic from day one uh, because I don't think the Biden administration can get out of bed in the morning without Israel's permission. Uh, and, um, and, and it seems to me that, uh, it has seemed to me, and I've had this in columns, uh, that they are essentially making, um, taking a position that they, they are confident will never come to fruition. So it's safe enough to say, we want to go back into the nuclear accord, knowing there's no such chance. That's been my interpretation uh, enough with me. Well, how, how have you looked at it from the beginning? Well, when the Biden administration uh, began on January 20th, I thought based on what uh, uh, President Biden had said during the campaign that uh, his administration will take the first uh, steps towards returning to the nuclear agreement. But at the same time, I was fully aware of the fact that, um, as you pointed out, uh, Israel plays a very important role here and they will do everything they can to, to prevent uh, returning to the nuclear agreement. Uh, my hope was that uh, um, the president will take some very positive step at the very beginning, at least alleviating the economic pressure on ordinary Iranian people uh, so that that would create a very positive uh, atmosphere um, between the two countries and also help uh, the moderate president Hassan Rouhani uh, to push um, for uh, you know, faster negotiations and so on. But uh, it became very clear very quickly that uh, the president has uh, no such intention. Hmm. Uh, Iran's position is that all the uh, sanctions that uh, Trump imposed on Iran after exiting uh, the nuclear agreement should be removed. This, because remains, are, this remains the position. Exactly. That's the, that's the position of the Iranian government. And the reason is that they say uh, part of it uh, are the uh, sanctions that uh, President Obama had lifted. And part of it are sanctions that Trump and Mike Pompeo imposed just to prevent the future administration uh, from returning to nuclear agreement, or at least make it very difficult. Mm. And therefore they uh, impose these sanctions under uh, you know, excuse of terrorism and violation of human rights in Iran and so on and so forth. So the Islamic Republic uh, position is that all of them should be lifted. Uh, on the other hand, as you know, the Biden administration says we, we are only prepared to lift sanctions that President Obama had lifted uh, and you know, remove them. But the rest, 
some of them will, they will not remove under any condition. And some of them, they are willing to negotiate. The central um, bank, uh, they will not remove sanctions on the central bank, I understand. Uh, well, so I see, for example, that is, a, that is a key point because if they don't leave, leave uh, the sanctions on Iran's central bank, that basically uh, prevents uh, any economic activity between what? Iran and the outside world, because that's how Iran deals with the outside world in terms of you know, commerce and everything else. At the same time, for example, Trump imposed, um, uh, Trump uh, declared the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary uh, 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 Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Now, whether, uh, uh, and regardless of how we view IRGC, the fact mm -hmm. of the matter is IRGC is part of the official armed forces of Iran and no country declares uh, official uh, armed forces of another country, a terrorist organization. And the Europeans are also opposed to it. So I don't believe Biden administration will leave, uh, will remove that label from IRGC and its uh, foreign branch, which is the Oats Force. And this is one of the things that Iranian government wants. They want to remove these labels from both Oats Force and IRGC. So these are basically things that I don't believe will be lifted. And because of that, uh, as you said, I don't believe uh, these uh, negotiations will go too far or at least as far as mm -hmm. what the Iranian government wants. Um, mm -hmm. And I must say, although I'm opposed to the Iranian government for many of its policy, I think they're perfectly right in this regard that all these sanctions must be removed. Um, mm -hmm. because of the agreement that uh, Iran signed with five plus one. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have a report. Um, we have a report just a day or two ago. It's Agence France Press, a AFP uh, is a good news agency, but let's yes. be put it delicately. Sometimes one has to check AFP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, they're on the very brink of a deal and uh, a very brink of an agreement in Vienna. Uh, I, I don't see that it holds much water. Uh, uh, Iran's, the, the American demands, if I understand them correctly, still include uh, dissolving Iran's uh, regional alliances, uh, terming them terrorists. That's utter nonsense. We'll come back to that question. Uh, and the missile program. Uh, I read an excellent article from a defense technology guy a few months ago. Missile defense systems in our day and age are absolutely key to a nation's security and asking and asking Iran to remove to to uh, cease its missile development is is utterly out of the question right. Uh, well, it, uh, Based on what the President had said during campaign the issues of uh, Iran's missile program and its alliance with uh, militia around the Middle East was supposed to be the next stage of uh, negotiations. In other words, they would first return to uh, the nuclear agreement, lift all the economic sanctions, and then negotiate uh, uh, for the rest. Now, mm -hmm. as for Iran's missile program, we have to remember Iran does not have any air force, uh, any modern air force to speak of. What Iran has are old fighters and bombers that, that were built in 1970s, uh, which are totally inadequate uh, when yeah. we compare it with what Israel has or what Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates have and so on. I, I, I hadn't actually realized that. Yes, Iran's Air Force is very, very outdated. Uh, mm -hmm. I have uh, written in many articles that it belongs to museums, not in uh, Air Force bases. So, that means Iran's missile program is the only effective way of defending itself against any foreign attackers. And in that, they have made a lot of progress. Uh, the, the, the precision of their missiles have increased dramatically. They went from uh, liquid fuel to solid fuel, which means that uh, uh, they are more capable. And they have developed all sorts of missiles, short range, medium range, uh, long range, uh, you know, surface to air, surface to sea, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe any Iranian government, 
regardless of its nature, whether the present Islamic government or any other future government will give up that, that uh, defensive system because that is absolutely necessary for Iran's defense. Yeah. And in fact, even in diaspora, Iranian diaspora that, uh, that is uh, mostly opposed to the uh, regime in Tehran, uh, many actually support the missile program because they, they think that this is necessary for, mm. for uh, Iran's defense. Particularly mm. when we consider the fact that, for example, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and all those Arab nations of the Persian Gulf have been buying American and European weapons uh, uh, worth tens of millions of dollars, and Israel is, uh, you know, equipped with the most modern air force and 200 at least nuclear warheads and five submarines and all of that. I don't believe they would give give that up. Now, yeah, yeah. how would that affect the negotiations? So we'll see. I don't think Iran will give it up, um, uh, at least for. They will not give it up. They may be willing to to scale it back a little bit, but I don't believe they they will give it up to the extent that 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 uh, the United States wants. The United States apparently want Iran's range of missiles to be uh, limited to something like 150 miles or 200 miles. In other words, uh, just uh, for defend uh, for for any forces that are uh, on Iranian borders, not anything else beyond it. And I don't believe the Iranian regime will will, will give that up. Will no, give I, that up. I don't either. I I don't know what's going on in Vienna, but it looks to me like they've uh, done something diplomats often do, which is go for some low hanging fruit, as they say, mm -hmm. at the front end, and then they report progress. But the <clears throat> the intractable issues remain. We'll have to see if your skepticism and mine are borne out, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm on that page with you. Um, there are elections in Iran in mid-June, of course. Uh, yes. Um, what is the likely result in your read? One learns that um, the reformists, uh, uh, Rouhani, uh, Zarif, and so on, uh, for whom I have a lot of time, uh, are... Uh, are likely to be turned out of office. Uh, what is what is your read of how it looks right now, and and how will the result affect the nuclear negotiations? In your view, well, actually, nuclear negotiation has been playing a big role in these elections uh, within Iranian oh, poli mm, po political mm. environment. Yes, because the hardliners uh, want to drag the negotiations out so that if there is any agreement, it will be reached after the election. When, the they reason, are, when they make it. Exactly, because they expect to win the election and therefore they want to take credit for any success in the negotiation. That's one factor. The other factor is if any positive result comes out of the negotiations before the election, that may galvanize Iranian people to go to, you know, polling uh, the voting stations and vote. Every uh, indication as of now is that uh, Iranians will not turn out in large numbers to vote. How is that? And, so? and past experience has indicated that whenever the turnout is large, and I explained this in my latest piece for uh, responsible statecraft, hmm. the reformists and moderates win. So they want to make sure, the hard ones want to make sure that the turnout will, will be low. And of course, because of the corona pandemic, that's an, another additional factor that may deter people from going uh, to the voting uh, stations and, and vote. So that's why President Rouhani has been emphasizing in his uh, domestic speeches that the sanctions are being lifted, the sanctions are uh, practically uh, broken, we have started to uh, export more oil, uh, we are establishing more commercial links with the outside world and so on in order to encourage people to go to vote. So that has affected Iranian domestic politics as well. If the elections were held today, I would predict that a hardliner will win the election. Uh, because the turnout will be low, and when it's low, uh, the loyalists, uh, those who are loyal to the hardliners and supremely the Ayatollah Khamenei, will be the majority of voters, and they will elect a hardliner. Mm. 
But if anything positive comes out of the election or something dramatic happens that nobody knows what it could be, which would galvanize people, would encourage people to go out and vote in a large number, then a moder moderate or reformist may win the election. So yeah, we don't know yet yet. Yeah, a um, couple of questions here. I, I, from what you say, I, I, I take it uh, a, a hardline administration would continue the negotiations. I, I hadn't yeah, really. Yes, they of. would, but to some extent. And the reason is that even the hardliners need the economy to start doing better. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because there is a lot of dissatisfaction and hardship on Iranian people as a result of uh, not only the sanctions that Trump imposed, uh, which are the harshest ever, but also because of the, the problems that we have within Iran. Mm -hmm. The sanctions not only have hurt Iranian people, but at the same time, they have given rise to this black market uh, for all sorts of things. And these black markets are usually controlled by the hardliners and their supporters. Mm -hmm. uh, but that has, although they, it has enriched them, but it has hurt the ordinary Iranian people to the extent that in 1990, um, in 1998 and 19, uh, sorry, in, in 2018 and 2019, we had uh, demonstrations in Iran against mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bad state of economy. Uh, particularly in the second set of demonstrations in, in, the, in November of 2019, where several hundred people were killed by security forces. Hmm. So even hardliners would want uh, you know, some opening uh, in the election, except that uh, they will be uh, probably tougher and they will, they will uh, be, uh, you know, they, they will take a, a tougher stance regarding to a lot of things that the United States wants uh, wants uh, wants them to do. Uh, they will, I don't believe they will give up uh, their alliance with uh, various militia throughout the Middle East uh, because uh, they don't look at them as you know uh, simply uh, allies, but rather as sort of a, a defensive shield for mm -hmm. Iran. Uh, Iran doesn't have any strategic depth when it comes to Israel because it doesn't have any air force to speak of. It doesn't have any. Um, common border uh, that uh, that can fight if a war exp uh, you know is, start is started between the two countries. So Iran looks at, for example, the Lebanese Hezbollah as a sort of a strategic depth that it has, mm. or the militia in Syria and you know Hafez Assad, uh, sorry Bashar Assad regime in, in in Syria. So I don't think they will give it they'll give that up unless, of course, they get security guarantees. But given the experience that Iranians have had with the United States regarding, you know, any past agreement, any security guarantee will also uh, not be uh, very credible, uh, whatever the Biden administration may offer. Mm -hmm. So we will see what happens. What, what uh, I take it the issues swaying this election toward the conservatives uh, are essentially yes. economic, right? Yes. Um, uh, uh, our questions. Uh, you know, does the does does the constitutional question come up, or does uh, the question of Sharia law come up, and uh, secularity and all that sort of thing? Does oh, absolutely! Um, one of the reformist candidates, uh, Mustafa Taizadeh, who was uh, deputy interior minister in, during the Khatami administration in the uh, uh, in, in his, during his first term from 1997 to 2001 has actually proposed a platform uh, uh, with uh, drastic uh, changes uh, uh, in, the, in the present constitution. Uh, he wants basically to move the country towards a more secular state. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to remove uh, the position of the supreme leader and basically combine it with the president so that there is just a single authority he wants to put term limits on the supreme leader. He wants to remove the mandatory nature of Islamic hijab for women and leave it up to women to decide what they want to do. He wants to scale back some of Iran's activity uh, throughout the Middle East. And he wants to, uh, uh, to get away a little bit at least 
from China and Russia and try oh, to build better really? relation with Europe and the United States. Mm. So that that is that is a platform that he has proposed. Mm. And in fact, it has attracted a lot of attention. He has had internet meetings with, with a lot of people through Clubhouse app and tens of thousands of people participate in these discussions that he has had. He has also been able to connect with some of the opposition uh, 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 groups outside the country, not the opposition that uh, in that low block um, piece, I call the fake opposition, uh, by which I meant the opposition that supports uh, economic sanctions and war and, and you know, you know, uh, having a federal system in Iran that many people believe it will lead to Iran's disintegration. Mm. But the, that part of the opposition that is against uh, sanctions and war and so on, but also opposes uh, the theocracy in Tehran. Mm. So in that sense, uh, he has been attracting people. But uh, constitutionally in Iran, we have uh, what they call the Guardian Council. And the Guardian Council is a constitutional body that vets the candidate for uh, national elections, for presidential elections and so on. So the likelihood that the Guardian Council will actually approve uh, Tai Zadeh for the election is something zero to, um, close to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, now in his absence, the other reformist candidates don't seem to be very attractive. One is the first vice president to Rouhani, Rouhani himself cannot run again because he has been elected two terms. Uh, uh, Zarif, uh, there was a speculation that uh, Zarif would run uh, and Zarif is popular in Iran because uh, a lot of people believe that, you know, uh, he's a very moderate uh, patriotic uh, uh, figure and he had the main role in negotiating the nuclear agreement with the Obama administration. But apparently the Supreme Leader did not allow him or told him not to run. And he announced that he's not going to run in the elections. So we will see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. The former speaker of the, of the Iranian parliament, Ali Larijani, who is a sort of a moderate uh, conservative uh, is going to run. Uh, now whether reformists will actually back him against the hardline candidates um, uh, uh, remains to be seen. They have said that they will not uh, support him. And if they don't support him, Larry Johnny will have no chance of winning the elections. Uh, so everything is up in the air right now. We don't know what's going to happen. And uh, to some extent, um, what may happen depends on the negotiations in Vienna. Uh, if something very positive comes out of it before the election, the dynamic of the elections may change. Uh, but if it goes just the way it is right now, it is very likely that a conservative candidate will win the elections. I think uh, up in the air is not a bad place to be uh, if you think about it. You know, I agree. <laughs> for my money, uh, Iran is uh, is uh, the most authentic democracy in the Middle East, and I certainly include Israel. Uh, uh, my my shorthand for it is it's a it's a working democracy with a constitutional flaw, right? Uh, that's exactly, a, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but in all of this, what's going on in the opposition? We get so little information about this, Mohammed, right? Uh, you know, uh, where's the drift of power and sentiment among the opposition now? Uh, um, <clears throat> are they uh, 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 are they focused on the economic question or? or the, the uh, foreign policy stuff, or, or where are they? What do they want now these days? Well, right? we have, in, uh, regarding Iran, we have two oppositions. One is internal opposition, one is the opposition in diaspora. Hmm. Uh, in my view, the opposition in diaspora, uh, the majority of it uh, is against a minority faction that has allowed itself with Saudi lobby, with Israel lobby, with neocons, with uh, you know far right in the United States, mm. uh, and which wants to overthrow uh, the regime in Tehran by a military intervention. But the majority, which in my uh, opinion is silent because they don't have any means of communicating their sentiment, uh, does not support this. The, the, the why they oppose 
the uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and his regime in Tehran. They also oppose intervention in Iran. They also oppose sanctions. And they also oppose many other uh, policies that the United States has had regarding Iran. Now, internal opposition has also changed uh, very significantly over the past uh, decade or so, particularly since the Green Movement of 2009. Uh, the Green Movement uh, was uh, a, a genuine a homegrown uh, movement that wanted to uh, make deep reforms um, within the system and gradually move it towards a bare state, a bare political system, and as you uh, mentioned, a more secular state. But the hardliners prevented that. Uh, they put it down uh, violently and you know, they jail a lot of people. But they also realized that uh, once they do that, then uh, uh, they may use, the, they may lose the population uh, um, uh, to a large extent. So when Rouhani was uh, running for the first time in 2013, uh, you know, reformists and moderates uh, could basically get people out to vote for him, uh, which is why he was elected. But there has been a lot of disappointment in Rouhani as well, because Rouhani performed well during his first term. He tamed the inflation, he increased employment, um, uh, uh, the economy started to grow, whereas it had been contracting during the last years of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And of course, he got uh, to sign the uh, nuclear agreement uh, with five plus one, uh, which opened up uh, some op uh, economic opportunities, brought some European countries to Iran, and there was some sort of excitement, which is why he was re-elected in 2017 mm. with overwhelming support. I remember uh, I was at the United Nations in 2013 when he had came to address the General Assembly. It was an absolutely magnificent occasion. It was really, yes, yes. Uh, but then during his second term. Uh, uh, the, the performance wasn't really good. And of course, uh, part of it is because of the fact that Trump reimposed all those sanctions and therefore basically killed all those opportunities for economic growth that had been developed within Iran. At the same time, corruption in Iran has deep roots. Um, these corruption, economic corruptions, uh, took even deeper roots during Mahmoud Ahmadinejad terms. Uh, uh, for from 2005 to 2013. Uh, at the same time, the IRGC began intervening uh, in economic affairs. They have many, many uh, corporations uh, that are either owned directly by IRGC or by their supporters. Mm -hmm. And those have played a, a major role in the spread and deepening of economic corruptions in Iran. In fact, it got to the point that even the hardliners uh, had to acknowledge it and they have been prosecuting some of these uh, corrupt elements. Uh, so that was another aspect of this. And of course, mismanagement of, of the economy, even with the limited resources that the country had uh, in the shadow of the, uh, of the economic sanctions uh, was a third factor. When the estate uh, responded violently to the demonstrations uh, in 2019, that also disappointed a lot of people. Now, those demonstrations were by poor people, by the uh, you know the the, the the working class, the, the mm -hmm. lowest of a strata of, of the society. The the, uh, the middle class largely stayed out of those demonstrations, and the reason was not that the middle class is happy with what's going on with Iran but rather because of the fact that the middle class is very well connected to the outside world and has seen what has happened in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in Libya, uh, and so on. Uh, they were afraid that if they come out uh, in large numbers and protest and participate in, in, in demonstrations, um, then there will be a big bloodshed and that big bloodshed, blood, uh, bloodshed will give the excuse to those who want to intervene militarily, just like in, um, just like in uh, you know, Syria or Libya and, and so on. So they stayed out of it. But at the same time, they have been very disappointed in the performance of the Rouhani administration. 
And they showed that disappointment because uh, we had a parliamentary election last year and the uh, public uh, largely uh, stayed home and didn't vote. For the first time in the Islamic Republic's uh, history, for the past 42 years, uh, the percentage of eligible voters that actually cast their vote was below 50%, because in Iran, it has always been mm. at least 55 to 60% and, uh, and as high as 85%. Wow. But for the first time, it's below 50%. It was only like 42%. And in fact, in Tehran, which is considered the heart of the political heart of the, of the country, only like 25% of people voted. Uh, and as I mentioned, whenever the percentage of the voter is low, the hard is win because it is the loyal supporters that go and vote mostly. And in, and, and, and in fact, that's what happened. Uh, the parliament's control uh, is firmly in the hands of hardliners. Uh, so uh, so that, that has been the development uh, uh, within the, uh, the internal opposition. Now, because of that, some of the reformists that always wanted to work within the system are now moving out of the system and uh, taking the position of you know, complete opposition that wants fundamental changes in the Iranian constitution, mm. uh, you know, remove a lot of power that the Supreme leader has um, and give it to the elected officials. Mm. Um, so that, that has also been uh, uh, you know, a very uh, consistent team among a faction of the opposition. Some of them have even called for a, a referendum uh, to ask people whether they want to continue with the present system or with a more secular, more democratic system. Now, whether that would materialize or not uh, uh, will remain to be seen, but the constitution itself, at least theoretically, allows uh, such a, a referendum Oh, it, take does. Place. it does. It yes, does. it does. Yes. Yeah. And that's why those who want air front will always point that out uh, to that, uh, you know, article of the constitution. Mm. Um, now, hardliners always uh, have used the large percentage of voters, you know, 55%, 60% and higher as a vote of confidence uh, uh, in their system. Mm. But when the percentage of voters fell below 50% in the last uh, elections for the Majlis, the Iranian parliament, uh, that was taken away from them. And they are afraid that the, the same thing happen, will happen in the upcoming elections. Mm. So that is another factor that is playing. Uh, I have a friend in, in Tehran um, who is very active in the reformist camp. And he sent me a message saying that uh, he was uh, uh, summoned by the uh, Ministry of Intelligence, uh, asking him what they can do in order to uh, increase uh, people's participation in the election because they're worried about it. And what he told them that uh, is easy, uh, allow people like Taizade, the guy who has uh, you know, sort of a radical platform to run in the election and create that excitement uh, for you know, for, um, for the at least possibility yeah. of some fundamental changes, and people will vote. Mm. But if you want to have the same the same thing over and over again, and basically uh, uh, reject the uh, all the moderate and reformist candidate, and just uh, handpick somebody to be uh, the elected president, uh, this time is not going to work. Yeah. Uh, and and as the experience with the Madras election showed, it won't work. So yeah. we will see. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, uh, the project for a regional security uh, mechanism. Uh, this is one of the reasons uh, Zarif has greatly impressed me. Uh, one reads very little about this uh, in the American press, I think probably next to nothing. But. Uh, <clears throat> um, and when the notion comes up, it's advertised as an American notion. Well, uh, Zarif has been talking about this for a very long time. And, and uh, you, you know, the, uh, the general idea for, <clears throat> for uh, viewers here is uh, a, a, a regional uh, security alliance of some form that includes uh, conflict resolutions of all sorts and includes all powers. Uh, the Saudis uh, are, are in the same room as the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Turks and so on and so forth. Uh, it's an excellent idea. And part of the idea is, is uh, it, it is 
it is regional. Uh, it, 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 mm. is, it is generated within the region uh, and does not depend on the United States or any other Western power. Uh, um, Zarif's been going on about this over and over again, right? Uh, uh, where does that uh, where does that stand now? Uh, I have great admiration for the idea and for Zarif for pushing it. Well, I agree with you. And Zarif has been talking about it uh, for for many many years. And and remember, Zarif has had. Uh, 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 fundamental roles in many things that have happened in that region uh, over the past uh, at least two decades. Uh, that it was involved in original negotiations between Iran and European countries during the Hatami administration regarding Iran's nuclear program. Zarif played a fundamental role in the um, Bonn conference of uh, 2001 when um, they were trying to uh, Convince various Afghan fa factions uh, to a uh, you know, national unity government. And it was Zarif who convinced the Afghan faction that is in their interest uh, to come together and form a, a national coalition after uh, the Taliban were overturned. And of course, Zarif has played a fundamental role in the nuclear negotiations. Uh, Zarif ideas are, of course, as, as you said, are, are excellent ideas, but the impediment to uh, actually implementing it is not, uh, has nothing to do with Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia and its Arab allies, as well as Israel, don't want uh, this to take place. The reason is that, for example, Zarif has said that if you really want to address Iran's nuclear program, then it has to be as part of the larger uh, Middle East uh, 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 conflict resolution. In other words, we can't we can't close our eyes on the fact that Israel has uh, at least two hundred nuclear warheads and, and everything else that comes with it, and then ask everybody else to be uh, denuclearized. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, wants Iran to uh, uh, you know. Uh, set aside its alliances with uh, various groups uh, throughout the Middle East uh, and a scale back is, 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 is its uh, missile program and, and its nuclear program and so on. I remember King Abdullah of uh, the late King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia urged uh, George W. Bush to uh, uh, cut the uh, head of the snake in Iran, which was Iran's nuclear uh, facilities. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what they want. They basically want Iran uh, to surrender. Uh, they want Iran to be uh, to be one of them, uh, not have a, uh, an independent foreign policy. Uh, and people like me who oppose uh, um, the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 Iranian government or the Iranian system uh, in its present form. Uh, think that uh, Iran's uh, independence, uh, political independence is very, very important because before the revolution, Iran had this dependency on, on the United States and so on. And one of the achievements of, of the Iranian revolution was this political independence um, that Iran gained. Yeah, one, one of the things I learned ages and ages ago in one of my little Marxist study groups was uh, it's always important to identify the primary contradiction and the secondary contradiction. And I can't think of a case more obvious than in, in Iran's, right? Uh, you know, the question of Iranian sovereignty. And so exactly, so. exactly. And, 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 and so uh, at the same time, the United States in my view has always wanted Iran to be sort of a client state. They don't want Iran to be an ally. They want Iran to be a client state, which basically carries water for them. Yeah. And of course, we have Iran a very does... peculiar definition of ally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and of course, Iranians are not going to do it. I mean, no. uh, regardless of you know where you stand in the political spectrum uh, uh, in Iran, aside from a very tiny faction in the diaspora that, as I said, has allied itself with Israel and Saudi Arabia, almost all Iranians support independence, independent foreign policy, independent politics, 
and non-intervention in Iran's internal affairs. And that's not, of course, acceptable to the United States. Mm -hmm. So that these are the impediments to the ideas that Zarif and others uh, have, uh, have proposed because in the view, at least the way I see it, in the view of Washington, the outcome of this type of negotiation should be that Iran become another uh, peculiar ally, as you put it, yeah. or a client state, uh, as I put it, uh, and uh, basically uh, set aside uh, every goal and ambition, independent goal and ambition that it wants, and basically become uh, carry water for the United States and uh, do what the United States wants wants it to do. And that's not going to work, of course. No. Uh, can uh, can you uh, can you clarify something that uh, has been on my mind since? Uh, Qasem Soleimani's assassination. My understanding, of course, it's again something I, one does not read in the American press, uh, is that at that moment Soleimani was back channeling with uh, with the Saudis about yes. this very thing, about this very regional alliance. And uh, you named various countries that don't want it: the the Saudis, uh, the Israelis. I would have to think you have to list the Americans in there too, right? Uh, is 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 your do you have any understanding? Of, is is that actually what he was doing? He was en route from Tehran through Baghdad on the way to uh, maybe not Riyadh, but somewhere in uh, somewhere in uh, Saudi for some back channel meetings. My understanding was that some back channel meetings were going to take place in Iraq. Just as right now, there are some negotiations going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Baghdad, uh, in, in Iraq, not in Iran or not, and not in Saudi Arabia, I see, I see. Yeah. But, but in Baghdad. My understanding was that Soleimani was on his way, on his way to, to, for, for, that, for that negotiations. But of course, they assassinated him. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia seems to have realized that uh, the Trump policy towards Iran uh, has been a total failure. And if anything, it has increased uh, tension in the region to some mm -hmm. very dramatic levels. So it seems like uh, they want uh, to uh, very cautiously a step towards Iran and try to negotiate something. At the same time, Saudi uh, war in Yemen has been a total failure uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Mohammed bin Salman had promised that it would be over in two, three months and we are in its uh, uh, seventh year, six years has passed and we are uh, mm -hmm. in, in the seventh year and there is no end in, 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 in sight. And Saudi Arabia knows that without Iran's help, uh, the war in Yemen uh, cannot end. Mm. So they want to get themselves out of Yemen. They know that Trump policy was a failure. It didn't bring Iranians to their knees or to the negotiation tables. Iran resisted it and uh, Trump left office. Mm. So now they are taking uh, you know, a small steps toward negotiations with Iran. At the same time, Iran also needs to some extent these negotiations because Saudi Arabia controls the oil market and uh, you know, they can overproduce and lower the price and so on. And Iranians need to export their oil. Uh, uh, so uh, both sides seem, seem to be uh, you know, a stepping towards that. Now, whether that would actually result in some uh, major breakthroughs remains to be seen. The hostility that Ben Salman has shown towards Iran is so deep that many people, including myself, think that these negotiations will not go anywhere. Can't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. yeah, go on, go uh, on. Um, the candidate you mentioned earlier, the reformist who- uh, Tarzadeh. Yeah. Uh, What's the matter with China and Russia? He wants to be more distant from China and Russia. I'm interested in that because, um, look, uh, I, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, partnerships and alliances among non-Western powers are really rather key to um, uh, achieving a, a stable and peaceable world order in our century, right? Um, 
uh, why would he why would he stand uh, explicitly against the closeness of Iran's uh, uh, relations with closer relations with with Beijing and Moscow Be China's there's just been this immense what is it 25 how much is it uh, 25 year agreement or something yeah 25 year agreement yeah yeah uh, 400 billion dollars or something yes. like that yeah um what's what's his thought there so far as you know okay regarding russia you have to remember that there is a historical distrust between iran and russia uh, this goes back at least 200 years uh, russia uh, separated by force large parts of Iran territory uh, in the early 19th centuries. Uh, and uh, so Russia also supported counter-revolutionaries during uh, the Constitutional Revolution of uh, uh, 1906 to, uh, uh, to uh, 1911 in Iran. Uh, Russia also occupied a part of Iran territory after World War II and was not willing to give it up until uh, the pressure by the United States uh, forced it to, uh, to withdraw its forces. Uh, so there has always been some uh, historical suspicion about uh, Russia's intention uh, towards Iran. That's one factor. The other factor uh, uh, is that, uh, and even now uh, they criticize Russia, for example, uh, Israeli forces have been attacking uh, forces that are supported by Iran in Syria, mm -hmm. and Israel has attacked them according to their own estimate hundreds of times, and Russia has not done anything to prevent that, even though Russia has good, very good relations with Israel. Uh, Russia also signed an agreement with Iran in 1995 to complete the Boucher nuclear reactor that had been started uh, during the last years of the Shah, uh, and it was supposed to deliver it within five years, but it took Russia 15 to 20 years uh, to complete it. It was dragging its feet. Uh, Russia has sold some weapons to Iran, but then delivered it for many, many years under the excuse that there is an arms embargo. Well, if there is an arm embargo, then why did you sign the agreement to sell it in the first place? So there is all there is these suspicions among at least some Iranian groups regarding the intentions of Russia. Now, regarding China, uh, I agree with you. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the text of the agreement that I read uh, that is supposed to be uh, the basis for agreement between Iran and China for a 25-year uh, friendship agreement, uh, if there is no sort of secret uh, uh, side agreement also, uh, and this is what some people are suspicious about, it is uh, in Iran's total national interest. Uh, Russia, uh, China will invest $400 billion in Iran infrastructure, which would be very good for Iran. And at the same time, an alliance between Iran and a powerful country like China uh, will provide Iran with uh, some sort of shield against the pressure by the United States. But some of, at least some of the reform is what they are uh, afraid of is that they think that uh, Chinese model of economic growth uh, without uh, major uh, democratic elements uh, may become uh, you know, the model for Iran also. In other words, the hardliners will take co complete control. They try to put the economy in order, uh, but uh, in terms of political freedom, uh, you know, people's vote and so on and so forth, they will, fo they will follow China's model, uh, which is, uh, at least in their view, uh, not democratic. So that's, that's what they, they are that's, basically. That's really strange because uh, well, as an American, uh, one must insist uh, democracy is not an export item. Uh, you know, uh, we, we can't implant democracy um, anywhere else, no matter how many times we purport to try. Uh, um, but at the same time, the Chinese model, you know, uh, Iranian political culture is, 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 is very sophisticated. I, yes. I just can't imagine anybody worrying that, that Iran would become uh, some kind of Chinese copy or something. Uh, 
doesn't make I any totally sense. I totally agree. To I actually totally agree. Uh, uh, even though there is still a lot of state control in Iran over you know, mass media, social networks, uh, the press, and so on, uh, Iran's political culture and atmosphere is really dynamic. If you, yeah, exactly, exactly. But there are all sorts of uh, arguments, discussions, debates are going on. There are all sorts of websites and and, and press, uh, you know, criticizing one another, making revelations, all of that, and it, 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 it is really dynamic. Uh, yeah, even though, yeah. for example, the elections, as I said, the Guardian Council vets the candidate, and uh, often they don't allow uh, more reformists or more moderate. Mm -hmm. uh, elements to run, but the political environment is very dynamic, uh, whereas we don't have that in China, for example. Uh, but Nothing at least like that, it. It's, you know, pardon it's, me? It's just a different political culture. I mean, exactly. You know, uh, and and this, this, this is something that has been going on. And, and this is actually, actually one of the uh, achievements of the Iranian revolution, because yeah. I was in, uh, I lived in Iran uh, during the last 10 years of the Shah and I was university student there. And it was total uh, repression. Um, mm -hmm. There was nothing to read. You would go to bookstores and there was no book to read. They would not allow publication of any books. There was no press to speak of. Elections were never, never meaningful. They were not competitive and so on. Now, every year, thousands of new books are, are, are published in Iran. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the work of the best authors around the world are translated almost immediately and, and published in Iran. There is this uh, social network is very active, website and so on and so forth. And people are very, very sophisticated. I remember there was this program um, um, by John Stewart. Who, uh, he had sent somebody uh, to Iran, and, and the guy had gone to you know a remote area of Iran, and he asked this old man, "Who is the speaker of uh, U.S. Congress?" And he said, um, uh, "Mrs. Nancy Pelosi," with that with that accent. And then the same guy in Washington asked American, "Who is the speaker of the of, of the Congress?" And he didn't know. Uh, that uh, Nancy Pelosi <laughs> was a speaker of the Congress at that time. So that's the level of sophistication that we have. Uh, excellent, in, e excellent exercise. Um, yes. Do you feel like talking about Palestine for a moment, Mohammed? Or of what's course. the thought there uh, and how we run? What's going on? Uh, this is, a, for my money, uh, it's it's too early to say, but the the tide may be turning in terms of public opinion on Yes. world opinion on Israel, one could not be more pleased. Uh, what's going on in Iran here? And how does the Palestine situation, uh, what's Iran saying? Uh, what's, how do Iranians feel about this? Uh, well, first of all, we have to remember, Israelis try to make this uh, Hamas versus Israel in what's going on right now. And of, of course, Hamas supposedly gets everything that it has from Iran, uh, which is actually not true. Uh, uh, for example, when the war in Syria started, uh, Hamas said they are neutral and that angered Iranians and they cut off all aids to Hamas uh, for, 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 for many, many years. Now within Iran, uh, the sympathy of Iranian people are of course with Palestinian people. Uh, the, they sympathize with what's going on, they sympathize with uh, Palestinian people regarding what Israel is doing to them and so on. But at the same time, because the uh, uh, Islamic Republic has uh, always uh, sided with the so-called rejectionist uh, front, mm -hmm. uh, saying that there should be a referendum in entire Palestine and people should decide, everybody should vote and everybody should decide what kind of countries they want. and the uh, perception of the Iranian people is that Iran spends a lot of uh, money for Palestinians and so on. There is also this sense, this, you know, this uh, dual uh, sort of dual uh, uh, sympathies and thinking. On one hand, they sympathize with the people, with the Palestinian people. On the other hand, um, they think that, uh, that uh, the rhetoric of the Iranian government uh, or Ayatollah Khamenei regarding Palestine has hurt people. 
the best position that uh, any Iranian government had during the past 42 years since the Iranian revolution was the position that uh, former president Mohammad Khatami took. When he was president, he basically declared that um, any agreement that the Palestinians reach with Israel will be acceptable by Iran. Uh, if they want to, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, uh, in in May 2003, uh, Khatami sent a comprehensive proposal through the Swiss embassy in Tehran, because Swiss embassy is uh, basically um, uh, represents uh, U.S. interests in Tehran. Yeah to the Swiss embassy in Tehran, to the George W. Bush administration regarding a resolution of all areas of conflict between Iran and the United States, including Israel. Uh, they said that they would, uh, they would help disarming Lebanese Hezbollah in Lebanon and, and con convert it, transform it into a totally political uh, organization. They would accept any, uh, uh, agreement between Palestinians and Israel uh, and everything else. But of course, George W. Bush administration rejected it. Mm. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the present condition, of course, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini following the footsteps of Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, uh, the founder of the Israeli Republic, uh, totally opposes Israel. Uh, but it's not the way they, you know, they, they, they put it this way. Uh, Khomeini has always said that uh, we are not against Jewish people. We are not against, uh, you know, we don't have any enmity towards them. We just want a referendum in the entire Palestine um, so that everybody, every Palestinian, every Israeli can, can, can vote. And of course, uh, Israel doesn't want that uh, because mm -hmm. it is obvious what the outcome would be. So they yeah. don't want a one state solution, um, but they also don't want two state solution. And uh, it was just a phantom uh, that fooled people for many, many years uh, that you know we are moving towards two state solution. No, there is no two state solution. Yeah. Yeah. And there is also no one state solution. So that's that's the uh, uh, state of affairs. But you, you also know that you know, there is a strong censorship uh, regarding any sympathy for, for Palestinians. Uh, outside here in the United States. In fact, I just posted an article last night on antiwar.com oh. uh, describing how Facebook closed my main Facebook page after I posted uh, a post saying that just as we made Black Lives Matter uh, a symbol of the, uh, of the movement against po police brutality and discrimination and so on, let's make Palestinian Lives Matter also a, sim a global symbol of you know, a movement against what Israel is doing uh, to Palestinians. Palestinian lives do matter of course, uh, and, and, and they're losing you know, a lot of people, innocent civilians in Gaza and the West Bank and so on. And Facebook immediately closed my, my Facebook page. Did uh, they really? Yes, yes, they did. Yes, they, they blocked it right away. You uh, mentioned uh, you mentioned Hatami. Uh, that he was a uh, and remains, I guess, a, a, a very enlightened man, right? Uh, his his Iran was is is the Iran I know from my brief time there. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a good, it was a great period for Iran, you know. Yes, <clears throat> Professor, uh, I want to thank you for your time. <clears throat> Uh, do you have more to say? Talk about Hatami for a second. I just want to say uh, Hatami remains a popular figure within Iran. He does, as you he said, does. he's yes, he he is an enlightened man. Uh, people can consider him a man uh, who is patriotic, has good intention, wants uh, democratic values for Iran, but uh, under the current conditions, he's powerless. Mm. Uh, so all he can do is just you know just give warnings that we cannot continue like this. We have to take a better path, hmm. a more enlightened path and so on. Does his, uh, does his dialogue of civilizations uh, survive as, an, as a concept or? Uh... Yes, I think there is, uh, the UN actually set up an organization uh, for dialogue of civilization. Oh. Uh, oh. But uh, when the American civilization uh, <laughs> 
prefers to uh, to wage war rather than have dialogues. Then I don't know where, where that would go. <laughs> American civilization. Wow, there's a term we must uh, consider carefully. Uh, professor, thank you immensely. Uh, I, I will add before we sign off, uh, <clears throat> it's a delight to meet you uh, for the benefit of viewers. Uh, uh, Mohammed and I have corresponded for a very long time again because we connected through his writings. Uh, and this is the first time I've met him, met, I suppose, in quotation marks. <laughs> so it's a special pleasure to have you. And I, I, uh, I, I am immensely grateful. It was a pleasure and honor to uh, meet meet you on the internet uh, after reading your writing for all these years. Oh, bless you for uh, and, that. Uh, I love your progressive positions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you again whenever you want me to. Uh, another time for certain, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Bye.